Webinars are hot. As a content marketing professional, I've produced hundreds of videos for social and traditional media platforms and currently work with one of the largest podcast networks in the country. So for me, understanding how webinars work in the B2B space is both essential to my professional development and an exciting form of content creation. According to a study commissioned by digital agency DemandWave, 41% of B2B marketers cite webinars as the best marketing tactic for driving revenue. I've set out to discuss webinars with one of the foremost experts in the field, Matt Lay, president of the Streaming Network in Toronto. Together, we've created this multi-part series of videos and podcasts, the webinar, Lessons from the Front Line, or How I Learned to Live with Never Getting a Second Chance with Live Virtual Events. Matt Lay, welcome back to webinar, Lessons from the Front Line. So today we're talking about return on investment. Correct. There's an investment that needs to be made both in terms of time and money to execute a webinar program. It's, it's, it's uh, um, something that's, that's essential. Every business will want, if they're going to make that investment, a definable ROI. Yep. So how do you, when you're going out to a company, define ROI for your customers? I mean, it's a good question, um, clearly, uh, but I don't, they do. So when so. it's there, every customer is different. So um, recently I was out with a, a group of customers in Vancouver, two software companies um, out there, uh, spoke to two marketers and I asked the simple question, what does ROI look like for you? Like, what are you looking to achieve? And oftentimes they'll cite to me a number a number of people through the program because whether they've got a real data point that says that that will get them to their goals this year or their boss said you need to drive this many leads through the webinar program, they, they, they quantify it by that number. And depending on who they are, that number can be very, very different um, in that, you know, one company sells a average deal size of $75,000 plus, plus, plus with pro services, and the other one has an average deal size of $500, and sales on that level doesn't even engage. They want people buying online. It's a B2B software play, but it's a, it's a, it's a low sub. So in one case, they needed to get 3,000 people through in the course of 12 months, and in the other case, they needed to get 5,000 people in one week. Of, of events, a series of events. So probably 5,000 a month is what, what they needed through. So each of their KPIs were different um, sort of to, to get them to the ROI. Now, unfortunately, that question is, that answer is always a number of people and it's usually I need to get more, I need to get more, I need to get more, because the idea is, is that more people through mean more revenue, more leads or whatever it might be. It's, it's the top, still the top of the funnel. You gotta get as many in the, in the webinar yeah. Like, like you got to get as many people through as possible. You do. You yeah. got to get them through as possible. But, you know, when I go out to, to and this is what I try to instill in the um, uh, in marketers that I talk to, is that, you know, the last few conferences that I've gone out, out, out to, marketing conferences, um, a lot of them are talking about the idea that followers and just the sheer volume of leads, it's an, it's an ego play. Mm -hmm. It's not actually necessarily driving, driving revenue. Because the third meeting I had in Vancouver was with a, uh, a fairly large known social media software company that I think everyone can guess who it is. And they had a, a completely opposite problem in that their quarterly webinars drive like 10,000 registrants. They get so many people through their webinar program that sales doesn't even want the leads or doesn't want to follow up with them because they don't think that they're good leads. They're right. not qualified leads, right? And so they're looking to, to skim out of those uh, 10,000 registrants, whatever it is, 7,000 viewers, 5,000 viewers, they're looking to skim out who are those that are engaged and at the right point in the buying cycle so that sales can engage. And I would argue if you're getting 10,000 registrants or you're getting 10, the same math and the same logic should apply, right? right? You're gonna get ROI if you can pick out from those viewers who are the most sales ready of the, of the audience. Right, which is, Absolutely logical. Mm -hmm. How do you respond though? Because the 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 person who's hired you may still want because it does look good. Whatever yeah. they got to be able to go back is getting the numbers a, a certain threshold of the numbers up. Is that important? How do you do that? Like, what's, well, what's the process yeah. Around? So generally, what we do is in the last uh, podcast, if people 
uh, uh, listened to, we talked about uh, data sets and numbers and best practices. And so we spent a lot of time documenting what are the best practices to driving registration? What are the things you need to do to convert to viewership? And how do you reuse the content in the best way to get more people through the program? So definitely more is, is important. But I'll tell a story um, that I tell quite often about a customer who, um, a big global brand who, before they were working um, uh, on, on our platform, were hosting these really huge webinars. They would bring out thought leaders and, and they would promote the hell out of them everywhere and they would get thousands and thousands of viewers. And, and then once they um, moved to our platform, integrated with their marketing automation tool and started to get a little more insight into what happens after someone views, they recognized that 7.2% of uh, viewers became buyers inside of 90 days. And they could hang their hat on it. They could watch it happen. So for them, it was less about the thousands on these big webinars because they needed to influence pipeline in a, in a very complex organization that sells many products, has people at different stages of pipeline. And so they took their data set that they had, that 7.2, and they figured out how can they drive the most revenue and the right revenue. And they applied their webinar strategy to those problems. So we've got a lot of, call it uh, middle of funnel um, people on this product set. We will apply this, this month middle of the funnel webinars to that product set to move those guys to purchases. Mm -hmm. If we've got low uh, leads or a low funnel on this product set, we will apply webinars to that to start turning into more purchasers in so that product you can, set. You can cater it based on the strategic yep. goals and where people are within the, the purchase funnel. Exactly, but that's, that's be only because they knew that there was their 7.2%. Right. Now I say that to other people and they're like 7.2%, we get like 20% turn into buyers. That's great. That's not these guys' numbers, yeah. right? So, so you got to know your numbers, kind of, and how to get there. Right. And although um, I do agree, I, we all want more. Um, we're having more and more conversations about the um, intelligence of the data and making sure that we are, even if we are getting more, that we're pulling out the right leads. When you get the right leads and they get to sales, they respect the leads. And when sales and marketing have that have that uh, bilateral respect going on between uh, between leads and, and going after them, that's when real revenue impact starts occurring quicker. Right, right. So uh, a lot of the, the conversation we've had, it, it's this is obviously a an amazing tool for sales people to get engaged, to go yeah. out there, to, to tap into potential clients. Um, but it's, you know, all content is a ultimately a marketing vehicle yeah when you when you're using content you're so you know you're 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 focusing on driving sales but obviously you're dealing with marketing departments as well in some cases they probably want to they have their own objectives they want to have more control over the over well, the well process. Nine, nine, nine percent of the people who buy my product or nine percent of the people I work with on a daily basis are marketers right the goal is to get people through their program to give them to sales right right and so sales they're interesting folks. And I say this without you know, um, having any problem with this since I'm a salesperson. That's, right. what, that's where I came up through this. I learned this stuff through my engagements with customers, but I am in, at, at the heart a salesperson. Mm -hmm. And you know, sales will, my sales team even, so hopefully they don't listen to this, but my sales team, where are the leads, Matt? Where are the leads? We need more leads. Then you give them leads, and what's the first thing they say? The leads are crap. Mm -hmm. They're not qualified. Right. I'm not going to sift through all that crap, right? And so, as marketers, we have an an amazing opportunity with the webinar to be able to um, hand to um, hand to our sales team the Glen Gary leads. And you were going to the Glen Gary leads. Yeah. So <laughs> that that for those who are you know younger than us, I mean that list of leads of people that are both demographically right, they're our buyer, they're our buyer persona, whatever that looks like, and we know them to be in the buying cycle. They're somebody who could tomorrow, with the proper pitch, timing, and understanding of their business, could buy our product. And that's what we want to hand people. I had a meeting with a marketer not too long ago, and we sat down, and um, I started going through our pitch, or we started talking about this to them, and they like stopped me and, and basically said that in their mind, their job is to bring someone all the way to contract negotiation. If they're doing their job right, sales is on the phone every day negotiating contracts. Um, and to do that, they need to have a lot of insights. So 
what we've what we've sort of talked to people about is that you know you've you probably as a marketer you probably already got your demographic data down right so i know that a marketing uh, manager within a large organization who doesn't have any buying authority is not going to be the person to, to sign my contract they might be an influencer but they're not my buyer persona mm-hmm. my buyer persona is quite a bit further up their director of demand gen Maybe in smaller organizations of VP marketing, they usually don't get their, their, you know, into the webinar programs that much, but they might. But it's 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 that person who's got the highest level of responsibility for leads in the organization, who has the budget to buy my product. Right. So that's my demographic. So if you and me go to go to a webinar for somebody, and your your title is you know a content or writer or journalist, whatever you write into that field when you sign up, mm-hmm. and mine says president. The sales rep team, when they get all of the leads, the, if they just get all of them, 100 go, 200, 300 go to them, they go in and they look at the information. I'm going to score really high demographically. I'm a president. I have purchasing authority. You're going to score lower demographically. Even if our organization's right for them, you're going to be lower. Mm-hmm. Now, if you stay on the, at that webinar and you spend the whole time with it, you're there till the end. You might even go back because you're a journalistic type who likes to take notes, you might Mm -hmm. go back and watch the archive and maybe pull a few points or review a few things. You might ask a question. You might download a resource. You haven't taken a step to say, I want to talk to sales, but you've showed a great amount of engagement in the topic. Now let's say I go to it and I say for 20 minutes and then I leave. I may have not heard a, a single word of it. Someone could have come into my office, I grabbed my laptop, it was playing in the background, I paid no attention. Yeah. Without that behavioral analytics or without that understanding of how, just how engaged you were, the um, the sales team is going to look at it and I'm in their mind the Glenn Gary lead. But when they call me, I'm going to say I didn't even I didn't even look at the webinar. Yeah. I who? I, I yeah, I signed up for it. I didn't see is there a recording maybe I can get to at some point. Send me that. I'm nowhere near it. Yeah. They call you. There's a chance you might have four, five, six, seven questions for them about the content because you were so engaged and you were so into it. And so that behavioral, inf- the, the, the bright mix, in fact, is the buyer, me, at that behavioral level. That's the Glen Gary lead. Yeah. But in general, if you go to the accounts team, which you should, they will call and they will gain an understanding of where you are. If you're so low demographically, um, then maybe the SDR teams tries to give you a call and see where you're at. Yeah. Um, or I shouldn't, 20 minutes turning it off, I shouldn't go to any salesperson. Uh, it's, you've cultivated a, a, a new record in your database that's a president who's, who's in your buyer persona, but you haven't done your job yet. It shouldn't go to accounts until right. I've engaged a lot more, mm-hmm. so I should go back into the drip. Right. Is there a way to get that person re-engage with the content? Like you send it to them again? I guess there's no way to know. Or, or well, you know that they've watched it for 20 minutes. Yeah. Do you need? Can you move them into a better position through various techniques, or is it kind of they didn't buy into it, so we're we're going to move on? I'm yeah. So I'm not going to pretend to know all the tactics that the modern marketer will use, but generally speaking, I showed a level of interest. I'm not ready for the accounts team. Maybe I'm not even ready for the SDR team. So I should be getting a more aggressive drip now after this, right? right? So if I was a suspect before who maybe, you know, went to your website once, in Canada, you gotta be Castle, so maybe I'm on the list. Um, You're gonna have a certain amount of cadence in the way you communicate with me. Once I've taken that step of going to a webinar and participating for a certain amount of time, definitely you've got the opening to hit me with more, right? right? So give me more. I didn't watch the whole webinar. And really participate, maybe give me a tool or a white paper or an interactive tool that supports the content right. and see if it was just a matter of time or, whate- or, right. or whatever it might be. And then when I engage with that, you combine those few things, 20 minutes on webinar, full engagement on, a, on an Ion app or something, now I'm into that point where, where, where the accounts team is gonna wanna talk to me. Right. See, the problem is, 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 I go back to that respect, right? I've seen it so many times, I was on a call just the other day with a marketing consultant who was uh, who had who had met at a conference and wanted to ask me some questions about this exact topic, and they're like, you know, in B two B, sales doesn't respect MQLs. MQLs is BS for for the B two B salesperson, which I can understand. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? We call it MQL and we give it to salesperson and we hand it over like Alec Baldwin in the movie and we say this is a lead and the person's like, what are you talking about? I don't know who you are. Yeah. Then you lose you lose your credibility. But I would argue that. 
um, that's just a problem with the way that we're with the way that we're scoring at MQL. And I know why it's hard because when you're using static content and when you don't have any behavioral anal analytics on the person who downloads your ebook, that ebook might be a huge high value for or a high value asset for you, but you had no way of knowing what I've done when I got it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like maybe I didn't even download it. I mean, yeah. or I'm sure you know I downloaded it, but maybe I haven't read it yet. Right. I haven't done anything with it. I didn't like it. But when that ebook or that white paper is put into a webinar format, a conversation around it, and I stay for 56 minutes and I ask questions, I do all the stuff that I, I referenced that you did, now you know I'm engaged with that content. And so I, I, I can't blame sales for saying they don't respect MQLs. I know there's a lot of talk about getting the whole word MQL just thrown out of the lexicon, right? right? Sales ready, get them to take action right then and there. Um, but uh, um, but I think it's our responsibility to ensure that we are handing over only the best to the accounts team, and that's why in our space we share. You know, you got to be pretty high demographically and behaviorally when you come through a webinar before you go to our senior account reps. Right. We'll give more to the BDRs than some will, um, and we'll keep some in drip. But you got to be you got to be we got to be pretty sure that you're ready to go if we're going to give you to an account rep. Right. Okay. Uh, what role uh, um, does the platform, having a really kick-ass platform, play in developing ROI? Because well, a lot of people do go without. So what's, yeah. what's the what's the what's the thing? Sell to us. Sure. Uh, well, <laughs> I think there's going to be a whole webinar on the, or a whole podcast on the topic of platform. But I'll give you a few things. Is that there's always a way of doing something that's manual, right? We all we all have done that in, in each of our businesses. We have you know, decide that we are gonna take a spreadsheet and we're going to manipulate it 17 different ways or maintain a Google Doc by dumping data out of one system and uploading it to another system. But when, when, when it relies so heavily on human beings to do those tasks like an assembly line, and we know that our offices don't work like Ford, we, we, drop, we drop the ball, we fall down. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes the webinar, ha people have less respect for the webinar because it's just too, damn hard to get all the great things I'm talking about it out of it. Right. So the modern webinar platforms, the newer ones, like the ones that the, the elite platform that we that we uh, are out selling on the street, and there's others that are, that are similar who have taken an approach that it makes sense for marketers. They automate a lot of the hard stuff. So they automate some follow up emails, they automate archiving, they automate data collection, they um, automate a lot of stuff, or they even automate the flow of data into certain other technologies like CRM and marketing automation. So you're not sending sales MQLs or SQLs, they're automatically going to the right salesperson. And when that automation is in, in, in play, then it just gets a lot easier to get our ROI out of it. So that's number one. And I, and I would say that the other thing that everyone should be looking at is what we call an active archive or um, an active archive is is that your your webinar doesn't get turned into a video that gets posted online. Um, the stats on watching video online, like on YouTube and stuff, I mean they're they're shrinking. Facebook right. apparently lied about all their video stats um, just recently, um, and part of that is because let's face it, a lot of the stuff is just uh, when it's con converted into a video, it's just slides and some guy talking. Mm -hmm. So what an active archive is, and a lot of platforms do this, is they allow people to interact with the content. You. When you went to the mall on uh, Christmas Eve back in the day, if you were like me to buy for your family, you wandered in and out of stores, you spent three or four hours trying to get your shopping done. Now on Christmas Eve, when I'm on my phone, on the way to the office, doing the last moment, well, yeah, Christmas Eve, but you know what I mean? On my phone on yeah, Amazon, a weeks, yeah. yeah, I'm going straight to the thing I want yeah. and I'm buying it, yeah. right? I might cross check pricing and stuff like that, but it's happening. I need what I want when I want it. Yeah. Your viewers the same way. They go on demand, they watch your video of yours on demand and they hear something that, that interests them, they need to be able to take action right then and there. Yeah. They need to be able to click and, and, and do things. And an active, an active archive allows them to continue to respond to polls, download resources, send questions, and, and all that fun stuff. Right. So I would say that those are the two major things, but again, we could do a whole 30 minutes on the topic of what makes a platform yeah. help with all of this. And we will. And we will. Marketers rely on these platforms for, for sales. Uh, it's meant to drive as, as a marketing initiative yeah. to drive sales. So, what do you say to marketers when the sales don't come? 
<laughs> the sales the sales team uh, sucks. Yeah, I think that's why. Fire your sales team. Yeah, I think that's why there's a new role like CRO that kind of bridges the gap. But um, but yeah, I mean, we talked earlier about the disconnect if you're sending the wrong leads their way. But what happens if they're not converting on the leads? And there's a bunch of stuff happening now that I'm reading about with uh, BDRs moving under the marketer, not the sales leader. Sales leader is just the accounts team. There's a lot of a lot of I think a lot of change is happening as marketing gains more control. Mm-hmm. But I would argue that marketing can take control, and in taking control, they should learn from sales. Right. So you know, we go through you know we went through models here about the idea that the, those who are most engaged in a webinar are at the highest level of sales readiness. They're the ones that go to, go to sales. Well, we've had marketers who have taken it completely out of sales's um, hands entirely. Why have a sales rep or BDR follow up with you when you come to my webinar right. and you've done all this stuff? Why not just ask you? So QA Symphony, um, who's a customer case study for, for the platform, um, gets about a thousand viewers. So they're up in that top 9% of, of, of viewers. And they found that they had a pretty engaged group of audience members who were pretty likely to take a meeting. And what they did was they sent um, emails afterwards or they had sales follow up afterwards. And one marketer said, you know what, forget this. I'm just gonna ask the audience at the end of the webinar. If they stay to the end Mm -hmm. and they visit this whole thing, they're highly likely to take a meeting. Why wait for any other human to follow up with them to book said meeting? We're just gonna ask them very casually. On the spot. On the spot. Those of you who are ready to take the next step, click here. And they click a button on a poll, and then those are booked a commitment from that prospect or suspect to go to the next stage, which is take a meeting. So I would suggest that marketers learn from the best salespeople in the organization. If you don't ask for the business, you're never going to get it. Right. Right? And there's no time like now. In between a webinar where hopefully you've told some great stories, made an emotional connection, backed that up with some great data sets or or some great customer stories, and people are feeling like, you know what, you might be right for us. What occurs between that and then even the next day email follow-up? Because when I bring this up to some marketers, they're like, yeah, we always ask them in the email follow-up if they'd like to get a demo or talk to sales. Well, who knows what happened in that 24 hours? Maybe they got their numbers and they lost their budget. Maybe they, um, who knows, some good, something good might have happened. Maybe they talked to a friend. Who knows? You had them there in that moment. Yeah. You ask them then and there. And the adrenaline's going. Exactly. Right? They're feeling good about it. By the next day, yeah, they're getting up. Who knows right. what's gone on yeah. since then, right? Yeah. You've and, lost the momentum. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you talk to sales and what is, you know, what is the high value thing that you want to ask? Is it getting them to a demo? Is it getting them a trial? Is it filling out a form to get a quote? Is a quote the start of a, of a sales process? Right. Every sales is, is different. And if you're going to be getting your sales reps, those Glengarry leads, and all they're going to be doing is negotiating contracts, then you need to be a little more bullish in what, in what you're doing, even in a thought leadership style. Mm-hmm. I'll give you one more real example, and it's the HubSpot example, which I've um, stolen ideas for from my webinars, mm-hmm. and I've told probably a thousand times since I since I met the marketers down in San Francisco. But basically, they recognize that they've got this one form that's super high value. It's a website um, analysis form, which basically measures how good they are, how good their website is built for inbound. Really, it's a form that the sales rep needs to do their first meeting. That's all it is. It gives the sales rep enough information that they can go in and have an educated conversation about how HubSpot might be able to help them based around this form. Right. So when they realized that that was their most high value form, that's the form that was getting them, you know, meetings with that form filled out or closing more than meetings without that form filled out, they built a webinar program around it. And what they did is they said, hey, who wants to be part of our next webinar? Fill out this form and we're going to analyze your website for free for you with super, you know, um, analysts, Matt and, and Pete Vamos. And every webinar has three websites analyzed. These two experts will sit there and talk about it, pick it apart a bit, make jokes about it, right. say the good things. And they, because they're HubSpot and they're super cool, when it ends, someone throws a ping pong ball at the, uh, at the presenters and they move on to the next website. Right. And so highly attended, 
tons of fun, low rent, not in a nice studio like you've got here, but in uh, you know just at a desk with a couple of hot cameras like on the on the. Uh, um, like those high, like sort of webcams. Mm-hmm. It's not like it's overly produced, but it's super fun. I've yep. watched a couple. I've learned a lot from them. But throughout, they keep asking before the event when someone registers. They say, "Okay, so you've come to watch. You know, these guys get their websites torn apart. Do you want yours torn apart? Fill out this form during the webinar. If you're brave enough, you can be on our next one. And if not, click here to get a one-on-one. Right. And post webinar, they're asking again. They continuously are just asking people to fill out this high value form. And as such, they're getting a 36% hit rate on the form being filled out by people who attend the webinar. Right. So that's 36% of probably thousands, I don't know the numbers on their on their program, who are putting their sales in the best position to close right. with all the information that they need. And that is, you know, basically a marketer asking, a, taking a sales step, fill this out and we'll talk to you. Take that, that, yeah, yeah. Take that next step. And so I think that marketers can take more control. I think that of all of the digital uh, mediums that are available to them, that the webinar gives them a unique opportunity to take control because while they're giving them something, i.e. this great uh, thought leadership piece, this great thing, they can then say, ask for something back. Yeah. That's not generally how it works in any sort of other content asset. That's Yeah, that's that two-way thing, right? Yeah. 100%. So um, it's time for a challenge. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've heard you say many times that webinar viewers do not like to take action. Right. It's 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 an issue. They they can, obviously. Yep. There's ways to make them, um, induce them to take action, but most prefer to sit back. So, you just talked about one example where yeah. somebody takes action. But like, what are what are some other techniques? How do, how do you get people to actually take action with with a with a webinar? You know, Pete, this is only the second interview that you've that you've done with me. But I have to say, the questions today are a lot more intelligent. Oh. What did you, uh, well, what happened you. between this podcast and the last podcast? I don't know, I'm, I'm, I must be learning as we go. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so what I was trying to do there was a bit of a psychological yeah, no, I got uh, it. technique <laughs> on you, right? You know, you're playing, uh, uh, my, my favorite sport that I play now, probably because I'm older and you know, not in as good a shape as ping pong, mm-hmm. it's the big thing. Uh, but when you're playing sports with somebody, they say a good tactic of that person is hitting their forehand really good, hitting that hitting that three-point jump shot is you ask them what are you doing differently what are you doing and have them analyze what it is they're doing right it will generally get them off their game right right you can mess them up you can mess them up yeah. through psychology Speaking and so, about how you're walking exactly look how you're walking all of a yeah. sudden you stumble well, right? you're, what's your gait like and then yeah. all of a sudden like whoa yeah. I, I walk weird all of a sudden yeah. and so so that's a negative side of it but psychology can be employed throughout your webinar presentation to induce more more engagement from your audience and get them clicking. Yeah. So while we're here one-on-one, and I maybe or maybe didn't make you feel uncomfortable with that question. No, it felt <laughs> great, are you kidding? <laughs> On mass, one of the things is that, you know, generally when you're gonna ask for, for, for them to take this big action, like I said, do you wanna take the next step? Mm-hmm. It occurs towards the end of the webinar when you've already accepted some questions. So one simple one would be to you know talk about just how smart the audience is. I cannot believe how great these questions are. What a smart audience we have. So you've complimented them on their intelligence before you're asking them to do something right. like take said action. And smart people would take this action, right? And so they, they, they could take they would take that action. The next podcast or one of the future podcasts that, that you told me we, we want to do is we want to talk about, getting people engaged. Mm-hmm. And we want to talk about people taking action. Right. And probably the most important single thing. Well, yeah, without it, you yeah. know, all the tools, all the interactions, all of the everything that we talked about about, about best practices and all of that, yeah. it all kind of falls apart when an audience sits back and does and, and does nothing. Like yeah. you mentioned, they're prone to do. Yeah. Like the data indicates less than 10% of people are going to ask a question. Less than 10% of people are going to respond to a survey. That number goes Further down, when you send out the survey after the webinar, they could care less about filling out yeah. your survey, right? Yeah. You're not getting people to take action um, if they're not if they're not in the if they're not doing it throughout the entirety of, right. of the experience, right? So, so psychology does come into play, and the biggest thing I can say, in case people don't view the next uh, podcast, which or, or listen to it, which we'll get into it, is that you need to make them feel part of the experience. The best TED talk even if they're just up there talking, makes you feel like you're part of it even when you're watching it on YouTube. It's got you thinking in your head 
about quite big, powerful questions. And then when they give you answers later on, that you're like, oh my God, the aha moment. They're making you feel like you're somehow, they're talking to you and you're part of that experience. No matter how good of a presenter you are, how dynamic or energized or excited you are about your content, is they might remember that, but they're not gonna feel like they're part of it if you don't do that. Right. TED Talks are generally the best presenters. That's how they get at, well, I shouldn't say that. I think with TEDx, we've got a lot of, you know, not great ones out there anymore. But generally speaking, you're a great presenter. You've got a great presentation. You're being asked to go out there. You know how to employ this. Our speakers, each of our businesses, do not. Right. And so, um, and so you want to create a format that makes them feel involved. Right. Right. So I think I'm going to stop with that. Um, there are ways of getting them to take action, and we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it in the next one. That's right. Um, Matt, thank you very much again for the, uh, for the great information. For those listening, uh, share this with, with people. This is, this is some great business insight. There's all kinds of businesses that uh, should be interested in webinars, and, and you probably know a few people. A great way to get the word out about your business and, and, and engage your, your clients. So uh, share this with whoever, uh, whoever you think, and, and we'll, we'll have another episode coming soon. Thanks. Sounds good. Thanks, Pete. Thank you.